Founded in 1885 by German-born immigrant Siegfried Bettmann, uh, although it wasn't until 1886 that they actually started using the name Triumph uh, for the company. Uh, they started off making bicycles actually, and it wasn't until 1902 when, uh, when Bettmann and another German engineer, Moritz Scholt, decided to fit a small motor to one of their bikes. And uh, that's when their days making proper bikes, you know, motorbikes, actually truly began. By 1905, the Triumph Engineering Company had a factory in Coventry, and about a decade later they came up with the Triumph Model H, which was fitted with a 500cc four-stroke engine, and uh, didn't feature pedals like many of the bikes at the time. Due to the First World War, which was raging at the time, uh, there was a really high demand for motorbikes from the government, because they could be used for army couriers, so the, uh, the Model H sold in great numbers, roughly about 50 57,000 bikes had been manufactured until like 1923 when they stopped making them. During the 1920s, Triumph became a major motorcycle and car manufacturer in Great Britain. Although when the Great Depression struck in 1929, the company just barely managed to survive throughout the 1930s. 1937 was a really good year for Triumph since that was the year that they introduced the, uh, the revolutionary Triumph Speed Twin one of the first bikes uh, to feature a parallel twin uh, cylinder engine, uh, which is a design feature that became really popular and common with like many British bikes uh, in the future. The Second World War came about in 1939, and once again, Triumph began making bikes for the military. Uh, when the war ended in 1945, Great Britain was in a state of uh, austerity, you know, meaning that resources were pretty limited. So unlike Harley-Davidson or Indian, British bikes couldn't afford the flashy trim that the American bikes had. During the Second World War, though, Triumph relocated to a factory in, uh, in Meridian, Birmingham, since the factory in Coventry was nearly bombed during the Blitz. The Speed Twin design would later be enhanced in 1949 and produced as the Triumph Thunderbird, which was the same bike used by Marlon Brando in the 1953 cult classic The Wild One. During the 50s, motorcycles became a cheap alternative to cars, so uh, many teenagers just ended up buying bikes, and of course Triumph thrived in this post-war market. Their bikes also uh, began being exported all around the world, especially to countries such as America, where they were really highly sought after. In 1951, Birmingham Small Arms, also known as BSA, uh, another major British bike manufacturer, uh, bought out Triumph, but continued making bikes under the Triumph name. 1959 was another good year for Triumph. The brand new T120 Triumph Bonneville, named after the Bonneville Salt Flats in America, boasted a 650cc parallel twin engine and twin carburettors, and became arguably Triumph's best known model. The same year, Triumph introduced the unpopular bathtub fairing on their bikes, I suppose in an attempt to uh, try and appeal to potential scooter owners, however this design was uh, quickly discontinued and by the 60s it was gone completely. The 60s started well for the Triumph, but by the second half of that decade the market was awash with Japanese bikes, which were cheaper and more reliable than many British bikes. In 1968, in an attempt to keep up with the revolutionary technology that the Japanese companies such as Honda were putting on their bikes, Triumph, in partnership with BSA, manufactured the Triumph Trident and the BSA Rocket Free, respectively, which were rebadged versions of one another. This brand new bike featured a 750cc triple cylinder engine and had ray gun style exhausts as an attempt to, uh, to look more modern. The bike was fairly popular, however it didn't come close to the all-new Honda CB750, which boasted a four-cylinder engine coupled with an electric start and state-of-the-art brake discs. The 1970s was a bad time for all British manufacturers, thanks to a huge increase in Japanese competition and frequent workers' strikes. Uh, many companies went bust. This included BSA, which went bankrupt in 1972, and Triumph just about managed to stay afloat by merging with other companies such as Norton, and became known as Norton Villiers Triumph. They continued making Bonnevilles 
However, they updated the design by reboring the cylinders from 650cc to 750cc. The Triumph Bonneville T140 Silver Jubilee Special was made in 1977 to commemorate the Silver Jubilee of Queen Elizabeth II and it sold well despite a limited production. Sadly, this lasted until 1978 when the coalition liquidated and Triumph was in once again a dire situation. The Meridian Motorcycle Cooperative was established to try and keep the company going and lasted for five years until sadly, in 1983, Triumph, one of the last surviving British names, riddled with crippling debts, went bankrupt. However, there was hope. In 1984, a year after the company's death, a businessman by the name of John Bloor bought the rights to Triumph. The financial move was somewhat the gamble, but it paid off, and by the 1990s, Triumph, now based in Hinkley, Leicestershire, came back with a brand new range of models like the Triumph Thunderbird 900, which featured retro styling to try and emulate the style of bikes that the original company made back in the 1960s. The new range wasn't just limited to retro bikes, however, and modern designs such as the all-new Triumph Daytona caused an uproar in the world of superbikes. In 2001, Triumph, now known as Triumph Motorcycles Limited, brought back the legendary Bonneville, now updated for the 21st century, looking almost identical to its predecessors, however with more reliable disc brakes, modern electrics, and a brand new 790cc engine, which meant this new bike was more able to keep up with modern traffic on the roads. Triumph Motorcycles Limited still exists today, and are now one of the world's most leading motorcycle manufacturers, up there with giants such as Honda, Suzuki, and Harley-Davidson proving that the British motorcycle industry isn't completely dead and still has much more to offer.